hello ladies uh, welcome back to my youtube channel my name is michelle and um, it's such an honor to be with you today and once again I'm calling all the girls we're still on the juicy subject of beauty and i'm, I'm back to talk about one of the things that um take a woman's beauty previously we've touched um unnecessary sex and then we talked about alcohol and today I want us to talk about words. A woman's words contribute a lot to her beauty and that's what we're going to look at. They can either contribute to a woman's beauty or take a lot of it away depending on how a woman uses their mouth. Praise King Jesus. So before we get any farther or deeper into the subject, let's have an opening scripture. So um, our opening scripture is in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 3. Praise King Jesus. First Peter is in the New Testament toward the very end of the New Testament, just before Revelation and Jude. First Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Okay, listen to this. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorrupt beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Okay, let's have an opening prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that you have given us to gather as ladies. Um, please visit us, send your angels, the ministering spirits to us as of salvation to help us dissect your word, reveal yourself to us, pour out your spirit into our flesh as women so we may be more beautiful, so we can have more of your DNA, which is a gentle and quiet spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay. So, ladies, we established that every woman is born beautiful, right? And um, even though we are born beautiful as women, we, you know, we like to take care of ourselves. We like to look more beautiful. It's second nature to, you know, look on point. So as women, we pursue to look beautiful in the eyes of whoever beholds us, whoever is around us, especially men. So there's two parties in this. There's the woman that's meant to appear beautiful. And then there's the beholder. You know that saying that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. And we established in the previous episodes that um, beauty is basically attributes about a person that trigger the senses of the ones, the one that's looking at them. And we talked about shape. Some men like a certain shape. Some men like a certain sound of the voice. Some men are attracted by, you know, whatever. Uh, sense of style. So it's different things that attract a person. But either way, as women, we pursue to look beautiful, either to attract or to keep a man. Yes, I know we look beautiful because we like to look beautiful. Not everybody that spruces themselves out is looking to attract. But normally that's how it is. Let's just call a spade a spade. Yes, we like to dress good, but, you know, we also have in mind that we need to look beautiful for whoever's responsible, you know, for us or your partner, or we need to look beautiful in order to attract a man, praise King Jesus. So I want us to talk about, I want us to understand as women, to take it very, very ser seriously that every woman is beautiful. Every woman was created beautiful. So there's no need for competition, even as a woman, for example, Cynthia may find Carolina's legs really pretty and she really likes Carolina's legs and she's thinking if only I had legs like for Caroline. But even Caroline across the room is thinking if only I had, you know, Cynthia's eyes, I would have been perfect. So every woman has something about her and makes her look beautiful. Because again, we have this thing about us where we say, or oh, I hate my legs or oh, I don't like the shape of my body. And, and, and th that's why I like the term beholder. Beauty is not about how you perceive yourself. Beauty, well, to a certain percentage, yes, a good one because we all need self-confidence. But beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. 
it's very easy and very, very possible that that which you consider to be um, not so cool part of your body is actually your unique selling point or it is something that um, another person finds attractive about you. Either way, everyone has something about their body that is very, very, that stands out. In marketing, we call it a unique selling point. Like you have something about you that stands out. For example, some people have very beautiful eyes. Some people have very beautiful smiles. If you know your unique selling point, it's best to stick to it, build on it, as opposed so no, instead of looking to another person and wanting to be another person. Because again, wanting to be another person is envy. It leads to jealousy and all of those negative attributes. So I'm thinking that for another woman to, to consider, uh, for a woman to consider another woman as beautiful or to like something about them, it should be from a point of inspiration as opposed to, oh, I want to be better than them. Because there's a thin line. There's a thin line between aspiration and the negative side, which can be envy and jealousy that is so bad that leads some people to weird mannerisms like witchcraft and all of that. So we need to remember this. Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. And by now, if you're above 18 or I don't, I don't know what age, you should know the compliments that you've been getting as you grow up. You know what works for you. For example, I don't want to go too deep into how one should look pretty. As I speak to you, I believe the Holy Spirit will minister to you. So I just need you to know that your unique selling point as a person attracts tons and tons of people. So it's best for you to focus on that because, again, beauty is just a door. Physical beauty, outside beauty is just a door, a crack in the door that opens somebody to come to you and start talking to you because they like something about you. It's kind of like a knock in the door before they can put their foot through, uh, through the door and start to speak to you and then establish if they wish to have any kind of relations with you or not. But I want us to be certain that there's no part of your body that's irrelevant. And um, that's in First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 24, I think. It says, but our presentable parts have no need. Like the parts that we consider to be so presentable have no need. But God composed the body have been given owner to the part which lacks owner. So, first off, I find that the operative word in the scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 24, is um, God composed our bodies. He is the composer of our bodies, just like you know who composed whatever song. So if God created our bodies, he composed our bodies, and, and we start to disregard a certain part of our body, we are pretty much disregarding God or disrespecting him. And the scripture is saying that whatever you consider to be so cool about your body, whatever you wish to present to people, that has no need. And then it's, it's going ahead. Well, it has no need as in it has no requirements. It's already okay. But again, that which you consider to be unpresentable, the Lord has already honored it. Praise King Jesus. So it kind of pushes me to a point where, okay, if I think I'm not all that, if I have a certain insecurity, perhaps I need to look more to God, the one that gave me this body part, so I can see the honor that he sees in it, praise King Jesus. But I don't want to go so quick into, you know, reasoning it biblically. I just want us to get to a certain level, even though I can't run away from scripture. Either way, there's something about you that stands out. It could be your hands, it could be your hair, it could be your body shape, it could be the way you speak, it could be the way you talk. All of that is determined by your beholder, the person that looks at you. So, like the opening scripture has told us, it is all well and good to have that which attracts a person to get talking to you. And that's the first part of um, First Peter chapter 3, verse 3. It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, like arranging the hair, putting on gold, um, fine apparel, like everything that attracts a person or anything, everything that makes a person want to walk up to you. Like when you're seated across a room, everything that attracts a guy to come and speak with you. The Bible is saying, don't let it be merely outward, as in don't focus only on the outward, on um, the external bit. But it says, but rather let your beauty be the hidden person of the heart, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. 
So right now we're talking about two parts of uh, one's beauty, the outer shell and the inner person. No, it's very hard for one to discover your inner beauty without having an attraction to start with. Like there's got to be a, an open, um, what, what's it called? An opening line, right? So um, I want us to focus on that gift. Um, Proverbs chapter 18, verse um, 16 says, um, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. So if, for example, you have such beautiful eyes, that is your gift. My Bible also says to me that every good and perfect gift is from above, praise King Jesus. So if God gave you very beautiful eyes as a woman, that's what gets you, gets you through the door and, and presents you before great men. But I want us to ask, what sustains you? Remember today we're, to, we're here to talk about a woman's words. The words are very, very key in a woman, right? Yes, I know men too, but this YouTube channel is for us girls and how to better ourselves in this life, right? So, so I have very beautiful eyes, praise King Jesus, because they're so big and when they roll, people's hearts melt. Fine, that will open the door for me. So I'm seated before a great man or a great person. How do I keep my seat? How do I maintain that? That is something that we need to seriously consider because it's very easy for you to close the door that has opened for you if you focus too much on what's not cool about you and forgetting what's cool about you or what has opened that door. Because again, insecurity is such a turn off in a woman. Do you know when we ask girls have that tendency to ask people, oh, what do you like about me? Like we need them to go on and on about what's pretty about us to get some sort of affirmation to kind of build on our confidence. There's a thin line. We need to know our unique selling point, work on it, and then focus on the heart. Praise King Jesus. So, um, the mouth. The mouth is the fastest way out of a man's heart. Unfortunately, your looks can get you into get you into a man's heart. But if your mouth is not used wisely, it can be the quickest way out of a man's heart or anyone's heart. Praise King Jesus. Um, but before we get too deep into it, I want us to have a discussion because now I'm looking at beauty so much in terms of a man and a woman. Because that's what us girls talk about anyway. That's what's key if we're to be very honest with each other. So just what is a man? What's the nature of a man? Mm. Men are the very intellectual. Well, a good number of them, right? So if a man is very intellectual, that means after he's seen my beautiful eyes, we'll get talking. And if I can't hold a conversation, he'll get, uh, he'll get bored. Like my, my eyes can be pretty for only so long. I need to go the extra mile and be able to have a conversation that will make him want to call me tomorrow and the day after or to want to see me again. Because again, if you live in a country like Uganda where there's tons and tons of pretty girls, very many pretty. And I don't know what it is with the statistics, but every time you go anywhere in the mall or out at a party, there's always it's almost like, what, 60% females and only 40%, 30% men, 40%. So there's a need to stand out as a woman. So after looking so nice on the outside and your hair is nicely arranged, you need to be able to hold a conversation. And then also men are hunters. That's their nature. They were born to hunt. Like they like to be on the, you know, to, to, to seek. That's how they were created. So as a woman, I need to know how to have my conversation to keep this person going without revealing too much, praise King Jesus, so that there's always something to look forward to. So I feel like us women have to really, really work on after the gift, after the external beauty. We need, we need to work on part B of being pursued, praise King Jesus. Then also um, men are alpha males. They were created to dominate so every time we're operating with them, we need to be extra sensitive with our mouths because the minute you come across as you're trying to dominate, you kill the equation and things mess up a little and no, no man wants to date a fellow man. So as women, we need to know when to turn it down a little and be ladies, praise King Jesus. Men are also very visual. So I can be the prettiest chick today. 
and then he goes to a party tomorrow and there's a prettier chick and he hasn't had an opportunity to phone me yet so i don't know what do we do as females mm -hmm. then also men are entrepreneurs they're very they're workers they were created to work so again as a girl after looking so pretty what do i bring to the table right men are also babies <laughs> men are babies Oh gosh, men are such babies. So how do I use my mouth? How do I go past what I look like to to build um, up this man's ego with my mouth? Because it's very easy for me to tear him up with my mouth or to build him up with my mouth. Because you see, these men were bathed by women. And for a long time, a man's best friend was his mama, right? <clears throat> and his mom speaks all of these lovely words to him. And then I come in and... Every time I open my mouth, I'm killing the little baby in him. They like to be nurtured. They like to be complimented. They like to be, you know, praised, you know, worshipped by their women. So that's something to consider as well. And a lot of times for us women, it is not what we say, but how we say it. So I want us to um, <clears throat> have a good think about how we use our mouths or our tongues, the words that we use how we carry ourselves in order to relate better with this species. Praise King Jesus. So of all the characters that I've given you about a man, there is it's quite a good number. But because of time, I don't like to give you very long teachings. So I want us to um, look into the alpha male. We'll, we'll touch two characters. A man as an, an entrepreneur, a worker, and also a man as um, an alpha male. I want to look on the biblical side of this aspect. Praise King Jesus. So, men were created to dominate. According to Genesis um, chapter 1, 26. Remember in the story of creation, God created the man first, right? After God created most of the earth, uh, the world, heaven and the earth, he created the man. And in Genesis 1, 26, this is what God said. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish in the sea. I'll stop right there. When man was created, it was put in his DNA to have dominion. Like they were created to rule. This is way before Eve was removed from the, womb, the man's ribcage. So the, the tricky, it, it, things get tricky when... We as females come in with the mindset of I have to dominate. I have to change him. I don't like this about him. I don't like that about him. I will change him. Ladies, please, don't mess the equation up. Because the challenge we have right here is that's how God created them. It doesn't matter how short a guy is. It doesn't matter how broke he is. It doesn't matter how unlearned he is. He was born to dominate. So every time a chick comes in and they try to rain down on them, especially with words, it doesn't work. And it's so funny. Words are our biggest weapon. The Bible says that um, the power of life and death um, lies in the tongue. So after you've been considered so pretty, it's very easy for you to um, mess things up by having such a loud mouth, by being so quarrelsome. And how does one become so quarrelsome? It's just um, conversations or relations is two people, right? So one person says something and um, the other is meant to agree. If there's a disagreement, it becomes a case of everybody wants to be right. So in an attempt of um, everybody wanting to be right and no, no one wants to back down, it turns into a disagreement and an argument. And a lot of the times when us women come in and we want to dominate, you want to change a guy because you want him to be that picture that you had in mind when looking to get married, we end up being very vocal. I don't know what's up with us women. We're so few with our mouths. We end up talking too much. I know there's men like that as well. I know some men that are very quarrelsome, but it's a very common trait in us women. So... As a woman, you know, tries to have her way to dominate via her mouth, because that's how we tend to do it, we slowly try to look ugly. 
A woman that looked so beautiful with lovely big eyes starts to look like a serpent or they start to look like a crocodile in the eyes of the beholder. Why? Because of the words that come out of us, right? The Bible says that what fills a person's heart is what spews out of their mouth. So we start to come across, the beholder, the beauty starts to go away. The beauty that the guy fell for starts to fade because of the words that come out of the mouth. And, and we, we, we lose the plot. Let's run quickly to Proverbs chapter 21. I think it gives us a very good description of what happens to a very quarrelsome woman or a woman that just will not shut up. Praise King Jesus dominating using our mouths remember we're talking about beauty so if you bugged this guy if he fell for you because he liked something one or two things about you our next homework is to mind our mouths praise king jesus so proverbs chapter 21 verse 9 says better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than in a house with a contentious woman with a quarrelsome woman this is the kind of stuff that keeps men in bars until midnight or past midnight. This is the kind of stuff that keeps men away from home and they prefer to chill with family and friends because they can't keep up with our mouths. Praise King Jesus. So if by the time a person prefers to live in the rooftop, it means it is World War Seven in the bedroom. This is... <laughs> so we need to be very very mindful this sort of stuff takes away the beauty listen by the time a person decides that they want to get married by the time a man decides that he wants to settle down with a woman he pretty much has everything he's studied hard he's worked hard he has a job everything is going okay and the only piece that's missing in the puzzle is i need a woman because remember, he grew up with mommy and mommy had, did a good job of taking care of him. And now it's time for him to find a new mommy, to find somebody that can, the last piece to the puzzle, praise King Jesus. So this man has everything and all he wants is somebody to get comfortable with, somebody to grow old with. So when I look, when I sit here and look all that and a slice of toast and he thinks, ooh, this is it, I'll have her. This, she's the one I need. And then I get there and all I do is complain, complain, complain. It's so irritating. You know, for some person is like, you know, a, a drop of water on a, on a roof or it, it, it drops doing, doing nonstop. With time, it starts to irritate the brain and, and we lose out. We lose out. Do, do you know, do you ever think about that one ex? that left you in Jan and by February he already had a new girlfriend and by March they are already married and you think to yourself, damn, I'm hotter. Like I look more beautiful. What does he see in that chick? Yo, <laughs> that chick nursed his ego nicely. She knows the right words to say. Yes, you're hotter, but it was your mouth. Praise King Jesus. So us women, we need to go past what we look like. Remember the scripture has said, do not let your adornment be merely outward. So we can have the lovely hair, we can have the gold, we can have the lovely clothes, but you, the hidden person of the heart. The Bible is referring to it as incorruptible beauty. So this is the kind of beauty that lasts until one is a hundred years old plus plus. A gentle and quiet spirit. Listen. It doesn't mean that you don't know what to say or you're daft. It's just that you know when to keep quiet. Not every conversation is for you to win. Not every argument is for you to win. Not everything that you notice is for you to speak up. So this is the kind of culture that we need to plant in ourselves as females so we can stay relevant in this industry of what? Of um, relationships, of marriage. Because again, every time there's a battle of the tongue and it ain't over until you've said what you need to say, we are slowly pushing the man into the hands of a person that knows how to speak to them. Um, let's look at, um, oh, I, I also wanted to share Proverbs 21, the other verse is 19. It, is said, it, it says, listen to this, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 19. Better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. What are your triggers? You not having your way? Remember that is pride. 
The Bible says in um, Philippians chapter 2, um, verses 2 onwards, it talks about humility. And it says, do not, um, we should be ready to do, we should not only have our interests, but we should be ready to put the interests of others before our own, praise King Jesus. So if every time for you it has to be your way or the highway, next thing we know is when the alpha male tries to be alpha because that's how God created him, then you start to raise your voice. Then you start to get angry because you're not having your way. So that can quite easily push, um, push the man into the hands of another woman. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 7 that talks about, um, it talks about the crafty harlot. Um, I think I'll read quickly from verses 6 to 18. Praise King Jesus. Listen. For at the window of my house, Proverbs was written by Solomon, the wisest dude of the time, who had so many wives and so many concubines. I'm talking thousands. So this man has a very good experience of women, so he can help us. Praise King Jesus. Look at what he says. In Proverbs chapter 7, verse 6, it says, for at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice and so among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding. <laughs> verse, um, verse 8, passing along the street near her corner and he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Verse 10. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside. At times she was in the open square, lurking at every corner. Verse 13. So she caught him and kissed him. With an impudent face, she said to him, I have peace offering with me. Today I have paid my vows, so I come out to meet you. So I came out to meet you, diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. Are you listening to this woman? She's praising this dude, and she's promising the dude peace. But why is she promising peace? Because she, know, she knows us women. Remember this harlot is short term, a night or two or even three weeks, right? And she knows that what normally happens at home is us women going on and on and on and on like the London ambulance, yeah? We do not keep quiet. We whine and we whinge and we whinge and we whinge like a broken record, praise King Jesus. Anywho, so she says to him, oh, I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face and I have found you. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored um, coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with my aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of, of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Now, ladies, you and I know, every time we are dwelling in the room of argument, it sort of restricts um, the business of making love at home because of the misunderstanding. And this woman is offering everything on a silver plate and she's talking all of these words into the man's ear. And giving him that sense of, okay, maybe I should try this. Listen to what happens next. Um, let's run quickly to verse um, 21. It says, with her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. Remember this guy, he just lacks understanding, right? He didn't leave home to say, oh, well, let me go sleep with this handout. No, he was just walking around. And then he bumps into this chick and she says all the right words. And now she's using her enticing speech. And before the man knows it, he yields to it. Let me tell you, men will, men love women naturally. I've told you it is a woman that pushed this man into the world. And this man was on the mummy's laps and boobs for the longest. And he needs a helper. Remember when God created man and said, oh, I need to find him a suitable helper. So when we do the whining and whinging 24-7, we're gradually stopping to be wives and we're turning into knives. Like every word that comes out of your mouth is a knife that's chopping him apart. And the next person that says the most beautiful words, words is good to take him, praise King Jesus. The Bible says, immediately he went after her as an ox 
goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Praise King Jesus. That's how these mouths of ours mess us up. They either build us or they tear us down. In this man, we need to know that they were created to dominate. Every time you try to get on top of a man, you're, it's like banging your head against the wall. Scripture says, mm -hmm. um, a man is the head of a family as Christ is the head of a church. Something along those lines. So the equation is man, woman, Christ King Jesus. And you know the word woman means of man. Like the woman was gotten from the man. So naturally, it doesn't matter if the guy is the height of your high heels. In his mind or in his DNA, he was born to dominate. So when we try to steal that away from them, we can't succeed. We're only stressing ourselves. I mean, right now there's possibly a woman that's gone to the prayer mountain for weeks and weeks and weeks and fasting and praying to God so that this guy may change because he's not how she wishes for him to be. And it is simple. God is simply saying, you know what, I just need you to submit. That's it. That's all you have to do. Because I can't change the way I created the dude. So it's you that has to submit, to bow down a little, to worship this dude. And then you'll have everything that you need out of him. In not so many words, you need to acquire an understanding heart. Praise King Jesus. I'll get into the business of the understanding heart later. But I also wanted to touch the part of um, men are naturally workers. They're entrepreneurs. A good number of them. Because I know there's some that like to be in bed till kingdom come. They don't like to work. But men are workers. That's how they were created. Remember in the Garden of Eden, um, Genesis chapter 2 verse 5, it says, Before any plant was put in the field. Right? Let's run quickly to Genesis chapter 2 verse 5. I don't want to paraphrase. I don't like to remove or add to the word. I like before anything was created, before any any um, any plants were. Hold on, here we are. Genesis chapter two, verse five. It reads: Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, but there was, and there was no man to till the ground. In other words, the plants were there, everything was in place, but the Lord stopped it from raining because you and I know that when it rains, the plants grow quicker. And he stopped the rain because there was no man to till the land. This is the first job that we see in the Bible, Genesis chapter 2. And it is the man that's meant to till. So the man has that DNA of working, of making money, praise King Jesus. So because of this, we have a tricky situation. Especially lately, women have, you know, women are, have been brought up. Women have given a, have been given a lot of attention, and they know how to work hard, and um, they end up um, earning more than the man. And this distorts the equation, right? The world has cared so much for the girl child, even bringing them up and sending them to school and everything, but nobody has really held the man by the hand. So we have an equation where some, the corporate world has been taken over by women. In the boardroom, you'll find more women than men. Women are really flourishing, right? And then there's, um, there's scarcity of men that are on the same level as them. And, and um, we find that lately men marry women. Sorry, women marry men. <laughs> like they do everything, the chasing and everything. So... It, it, it's, it's again it takes away the natural equation that God meant for this thing to be so we find that you find an equation where the woman earns more than the man and that creates a bit of pressure on the man's side and um, so it's as women we are meant to approach these men with a lot of sensitivity especially with our words Remember, there's things that you see as a woman that don't add up. You wish he could do this, he could pay for that, he could pay for this. But guess what? He just hasn't gotten there yet. So we need to find a way to use our words in a manner that won't upset the man. Because guess what? 
God knows that the man is the head of the house. So in a very short space of time, the Lord is going to bless that man and he'll be able to stand in his position. So as a woman, we're left with the homework of looking at the bigger picture. How is that? See the potential in the man. Believe in the God that gave you that man. Walk with him gently, even though it seems so difficult and tedious because you're taking care of all the bills. But believe in that which is in him. And even though it weighs so heavily on your heart, we will just run to the Bible for encouragement. But what I need us to focus on before I go all scriptural is don't bring out words that will tear his ego apart. A person can forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. So it is very important that you hold your tongue. It's very important that you keep quiet on the outside as you master the art of keeping quiet on the inside. So, so we get to a point where we need to know how to phrase our words. For example, instead of coming across as accusatory or you're, you know, ganging up on him, we need to be, to use statements like, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we, you know, <laughs> you don't come out and say, yo, why don't you buy us a new TV? It should be like, wouldn't it be nice if we had a new TV this year? And then you give him the room to come up with ideas. You know, we, we always, as women, we have the task of making sure that we put a man in his place where he belongs, which is above us, placed in Jesus. Or we could um, use statements like, we can start with statements like, um, what do you think of? You know, we always push it to his side, even though you have this brilliant idea. Throw some words as if you're asking him so that he can own the idea and then you'll have peace in the home. Because every time you come raining with your brilliant idea, even if it is right, he's most likely to say no because he's the male. He should be the one to come up with it. And then you're frustrated. And then nine months down the line, he comes back to you and says, oh, guess what? So and so said that we should try this. And it's really, really good. And you're thinking, dude, I told you that two years ago. But he has to go and listen to his friend and then he comes back and so it looks like it's his idea. You know that sort of remix, right? So we need to nurture what is inside of this man with our words so that we may have peace. So that we may maintain our beauty. We need to maintain our beauty by being mindful of what comes out of this mouth. Because even if you don't stand up and tell the guy, yo, I'm the head of this house. What you say, the way you say it, pretty much screams who you think you are. And then he'll start to see you as ugly. And then the next chick that he meets, that submits a little, even by 2%, becomes the next attractive chick in his life. Praise King Jesus. I remember back in the day, I have relatives that don't live in the country. So there's a specific uncle. And um, every time he was in town, he asked me to go places with him. And I'd sit with him and his friends. And I was quite young compared to them anyway. So I'd sit around and listen, listen to them talk. And then I'd start laughing. One of his friends would say something like, Yo, I met this chick. You know, she, she has such a soft voice. And then she she cut my nails. And then she, she made me breakfast. And... and now, when I think about it, this man lives in England, right? So, you know, England is rat race. Everyone's busy making money. Everybody's busy making the ends meet and we split, split the bills. It's totally different culture from Uganda. So I think the wife is so busy, like, you know, getting on top of things and like she forgets who the man is in the house. And when these men come to Uganda on holiday, they meet these nice Baganda girls who... <laughs> submit externally yeah they kneel down when greeting and then they do all of these things and the man is thinking wow finally i'm an alpha in this gig and it distorts everything so i need us to be mindful so i'll go back to the subject at hand the vision the vision i've told you a man is an entrepreneur a worker naturally if he's not yet where you expect him to be it is your duty, it is our duty as women to nurture that which is inside of him because it shall surely come out. It will come out because it's the will of God. 
Praise King Jesus. I want us to look at two biblical examples. Let's go biblical now. I like biblical stories. They really, I like them. I love movies, so biblical stories work for me majorly. There's a couple, well, not a couple. There's two people in the Bible. I think we can use um, David and Abigail. There's a lady called Abigail, and there's a guy called David. David, King David. Everybody knows King David. So, Abigail was loaded. David was broke. Guess what? David was broke, but he had a vision. Abigail was loaded, but she had a gentle and quiet spirit. And we see these two getting together because the equation was right. Right? So, um, this story is in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 25. It's a very long one. I don't want us to read all of it. And you've probably heard this story severally. But I just want to pick out how this woman used her words. Praise King Jesus. Because I want us to use our mouth the right way so that we don't end up losing the precious people that God has put into our lives. Praise King Jesus. Okay, let's look at um, 1 Samuel chapter 25 very quickly. I'll just pick out a few verses to drive the story home, but I'd rather you read all of it so you can have so much fun. 1 Samuel chapter 25. Aha. Uh -huh. Who is um who should we um look at first? Let's look at let's talk about David, the broke guy with a vision. David is anointed to be king, right? From a very young age, 13 years old. He's anointed, and the Lord has spoken to him and is going to be king over Israel. But it takes David 10 years, 10 years. For 10 years, David is living in the caves. David has a vision. The Lord spoke to him. You're going to be the king of Israel, the apple of God's eye. But for 10 years, this dude lived in the caves. And then after 10 years, he manages to, to, to take dominion over Judah. He rules Judah, which is only half. And for Judah, he ruled for seven and a half years. So he doesn't rule over the entire Israel until the age of 33, praise King Jesus. Now, imagine the Lord anointed him at 13 in the fields, in the garden. He was called from the garden, from the field, and he was anointed in the presence of his brothers. I think twice he was anointed. But look at how long it takes for him to become the, what he's supposed to be. For him to become who God created him to be. A whopping 33 years old. That's when he becomes king. So we know that he has a calling on his life. But now, and that's just a summary of his life. Before he even becomes king over Israel, David is broke. Why? He's on the run. He's running away from King Saul. Because King Saul lost the favor in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord decided to choose somebody that has a heart after his own heart. And he chose David. Now David is on the run because Saul is so envious of David. Because apparently David killed thousands of men and Saul hasn't killed any. David had the favor of the Lord. Praise King Jesus. So these guys. Okay, that's a good history. That's enough. So um, let's run quickly to Abigail. First Samuel chapter 25. So who's Abigail? Listen to this. I think we'll do verse 2 and 3. First Samuel chapter 25, verse 2. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was, listen, back in the day, the each job was um, especially um, in those days of um, the Israelites, the each job was um, livestock like rearing animals. So this guy was super rich, neighbor, right? He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was sharing his sheep in Camo. Then the name, the name of this man was Nabal. And the name of his wife was Abigail, right? So Abigail is the wife to the rich dude, right? She was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. Praise King Jesus. So listen, this is Abigail, loaded. But the Bible has said 
she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. So Abigail covered um, the scripture that we read at the beginning in 1 Peter chapter 3 that says we should not let our beauty be merely on the outside but also on the inside. And when the Bible talks about um, having good understanding, it basically means that Abigail could discern good from evil. And the only person that can discern good from evil is one that is in the word. Because I think it is Job 28, 28 that gives us a, um, a very good description of what the word understanding means. To, to understand means to be able to know what's right and what is wrong and staying away from it. Praise King Jesus. Where's the book of Job? I think it's after. Is it? Hold on a second. Job is before Psalms. Job chapter 28, verse 28. Listen to this. And to man, God said, Job 28, 28, right? And to man, God said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil, that is understanding. So Abigail knew to depart from evil. So Abigail feared the Lord. She had wisdom and understanding. Again, us guys have a tendency to be in church and we raise our holy hands. Oh, Father, give me the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Instead of you being very, very repetitive with your words in the, in the synagogue, just read the Bible. Because the Bible is what tells us what's good and what's not good in the sight of the Lord. The Lord will teach us what he wants. And then we can do that, which is wisdom because we fear the Lord, and then to depart from evil, that is understanding, because we don't want to upset the Lord. So this is exactly how Abigail was. She was beautiful on the outside, and she had an understanding heart. She, and she, she was, she had, the Bible says, she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, praise King Jesus. So, despite her position, this Abigail woman, the one that was married to Nabal, the rich dude, Despite her position and her beauty, Abigail knew how to use her words. So we're going to pull out a few verses to see exactly how this woman spoke to people, praise King Jesus. I like that. She, 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 because she had an, a good, she was a woman of good understanding, she knew how to speak to everybody. She was not pretentious. Because again, we have some people who are nice when they're speaking to people that are in higher authority. But when you find them talking to people that are below them, they're quite, you know, rude and screaming and things, you know. So, but this lady, she was nice to everyone. She used her mouth well. The first incident we can look at is how she spoke to her servants in her home, praise King Jesus. We can tell that this woman was very approachable because when something happens in the home, her, her workers, her servants, her maids find no trouble running to her to explain to her what's happening because she was nice to them, praise King Jesus. She used her mouth wisely, praise King Jesus. I pray that as we listen, as we share, the good Lord will anoint all of us women with understanding hearts. Because remember I told you, what comes out, what fills up a person's heart is what comes out of their mouth. That's scripture, praise King Jesus. So may the Lord give us an understanding heart as we listen, as we read the Bible more, so we may have more peaceful relationships. So our mouths don't ruin what the good Lord has given to us, praise King Jesus. Okay, we're still in 1 Samuel chapter 25, but now we're going to look at verse 14. <laughs> listen, verse 14, we're talking about Abigail and how she related with her servants, yeah? Listen, now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. Verse 15. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything, as long as we accompanied them, and we were in the fields. <clears throat> they were a wall to us, both by night and day, all the time we were with them keeping the ship. Now therefore, know and consider what you will do for harm is determined against our master and against all of his household. For he is such a scoundrel that no no one that no one <laughs> for he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. Praise King Jesus. Will that be enough for now? 
Okay, let's do verse up to verse 19. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves. Wait a bit. We'll stop there for now. So you see these men, right? The men, what are the men reporting to Abigail? These men were in the field, like you have seen. David helped them out. But David was broke. I told you David was a very broke guy. He was on the run. He was running away from King Saul. So we are backing up a little. So he didn't have anything to eat. And he heard that this rich dude was um, sharing his ships, you know, like how they trim the ships and everything. Normally when they do that, there's a lot of food. It's kind of like a, you know, a food festival going on. And David needed some food for his men. So he begged um, Nabal politely. But Nabal was rude to David because the Bible says that he was a man that that he was a man with who was harsh and evil in his doings like he didn't speak well when the bible says evil evil is basically anything outside of the word of god to not know how to talk to people or to not know how to treat strangers well praise king jesus so if, if i can back up a little and read for you how david was doing financially right so first samuel 25 verse 4 says when david heard in the wilderness that nabal was sharing his sheep David sent 10 young men and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel, go up to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, peace be to you, peace be to your house, peace be to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have sharers. Your shepherds were with us and we did not harm them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. Now, David has really humbled himself, even though he's the future king of Israel. Praise King Jesus. So when David's men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words that David had said and waited and Nabal answered David's servant saying, who's David and who's the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my sharers and give to men when I don't know where they're from? Praise King Jesus. So Nabal disrespected David because David was hungry. He was broke. He needed some food. And then like I've explained to you, Nabal's wife found out from the servants because they felt um, they were able to explain to her what was going on. And I want us to look at the woman's words. I know I've gone a bit because I needed to give you the history of the story. So we have a David who is so upset, right? Because listen, the, 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 the young men took a report back to David and, and listen to verse 12. So David's young men turned on their heels and went back and they came and told him all these words. Then David said to his men, every man guard on his sword. So every man guarded his sword and David guarded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David and 200 stayed with the supplies. So David was, you know what, cook your guns. This guy has respected me. So David had the intentions of slicing to pieces all of the men of Nabal's house because he was so, so upset, right? Look at how Abigail comes in with the words of how us women should be, right? So um, Abigail's words to David, we shall look at verse 24. Yeah, we can start um, from verse 24. When Abigail heard what had happened, number one, Abigail is so smart and this is how we should be. Praise King Jesus. Remember, she doesn't even know. She knows of David. She and David haven't met. But because of her husband's loose mouth, Happy Girl knows how to go and rectify the situation. As I'll show you in the story, first she knows to take the blame, then she knows to side with David, then she knows to point David to the Lord, then she knows to take an offertory. She did a lot of things with her mouth. Right? I want us to pay attention to this. It is her mouth. Praise King Jesus. So anyway, let's look at verse 24. So she, Abigail, fell at David's feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. And please, let your maid servants speak in your ears. And let 
and hear the words of your maid servant. So this lady Abigail, this is how smart she is. She knows that David is the future king. She knows that men have a big ego and they like to be worshipped. Before she even goes and, you know, she bows down and talks to him in this manner, she first sends some gifts over. She sends some food. Because the minute her um, her servants told her everything that had happened between her husband and the, David's men, the Bible says that she made haste, yeah? This is, what verse is this? 18. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five, um, what's this? She took roasted grains, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 kets of figs. She took a lot of things and said to her servants, go before me. See, I'm coming after you, but make sure you don't tell my husband Nabal. So this is what this is how a woman with an understanding heart operates, praise King Jesus. So she, she takes the food. She sends the food that David was asking for to appease David. So when David sees the food because his men are so hungry, this lady gives it a few seconds and then she goes over. The first thing that she does is to bow down and says, look, do not blame my husband, blame me. And she speaks so gently. And, and she says, um, in verse um, 25, she says, Please, let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now therefore let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. Praise in Jesus. Abigail, she's worshipped David. Abigail makes David understand that you, my husband, acted foolishly. But guess what? That's how he's always acted. In fact, his name means foolish. So please, I am here to apologize on behalf of my husband and also to remind you that, oh, I'm so glad I got here in time because I don't want you to go and kill my, my husband and all the men in our house because then you'll have blood on your hands. So all of these things that Abigail is saying, she's a woman that's read the word. She's, is it Proverbs chapter 6? Scripture says, God hates anybody that what? That pours blood. Praise King Jesus. And this, so this woman also, the way she addresses David, it's like she's not talking to David. She's talking to God himself because this is a woman that's always in the scriptures. Abigail knows that by the time David is chosen to be the next king of Israel, he must have a special part in the heart of the Lord. So, and, and she's probably asked, read chapter, uh, sorry, she is, Abigail has read up the book of Acts here, yeah? chapter 5, verse 29, that says, should we fear men and not fear the Lord? Like, should we obey men and not obey the Lord? So everything that, the way Abigail is addressing David is from a point of, I know that the hand of the Lord is upon you. I also know how my husband behaves. So please forgive us. Like, I'm willing to tell you facts here. My husband behaves in a certain type of way, but have mercy on us. Don't go killing all, of, all the men in that house. Praise King Jesus. So anyway, David listens. <laughs> David listens to Abigail. And she goes ahead to, um, to, to, to repent. And then she also, I like the fact that this woman also goes ahead and reminds David of the covenant that um, David has with the Lord. Like she's so smart. Listen to verse 28. She, um, where's verse 28? She says, please forgive the trespass of your maid servant. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord and evil is not found in you, in you throughout your days. So remember David is super upset. Him and his men are taking off to kill the house of Nabal. And she comes in, this woman that reads the Bible, this woman that knows what the Lord promised to David, that look, the Lord said that from your house, you will have an enduring leadership. Like you'll give birth to King Solomon. And then also through your lineage, you'll have Jesus. So why are you fighting with my husband? 
who lacks understanding? Why do you want to kill his entire house? All of this, she, she addresses David as my Lord, whilst pointing David back to the Lord, to the facts, to the covenant. Because again, the covenant that David has with God takes a bit of time. I told you how he spends a long time in the caves, 10 years and seven years and a half ruling over Judah alone. So there was a long walk to David being the established man that he was. But because he's an alpha male, anyone that comes to tell him anything that's outside of who he believes he is, anything outside of who God has told him he is, is super upsetting to him that he's willing to kill an entire household. It takes a woman that comes in from an angle of submission and understanding. Remember, she was already beautiful, right? And now she comes in on her knees and speaks to David of, have you forgotten what the Lord has said about you? Do you know that if you kill someone tonight, then you won't make it to the throne? She goes ahead to say, the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. We finish that part. Yes, let's go to the next verse. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies shall be shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. I'll read that verse again because it's very key. Abigail says to David, Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. But the life of my Lord David shall be found in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies, he shall, God, he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. So she's smart. I like her. She's reminding David of, why do you have to fight for yourself? Last I checked, the last man that you fought, you only used a stone from your sling, hit him on the head and he fell backwards and you had his head on a platter. We're talking Goliath, praise in Jesus. So this lady, the way she uses her mouth, she manages to nurture David's ego of, don't you remember what you did to Goliath when the whole of Israel was so scared? This is pure wisdom and understanding, praise King Jesus. Listen to verse 30. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord David according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you, no offense of heart to my Lord, neither that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. This is a woman that has read that scripture in Romans that do not avenge yourself. I, the Lord, will take care of everybody that um, touches my anointed. Praise King Jesus. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maid servant. Praise King Jesus. This is how us women are supposed to roll. What does this say to me? As a woman, we it is very, very important that we know the vision of the man we're with. Remember I told you men are alpha males and we have a situation where the lady earns more and the man earns less. So your homework then is to find out who he is. And ideally, these are things we're supposed to pray about before we even meet these people. As a woman, we're supposed to pursue who we are. When, when a woman knows who she is in Christ, it gives them a certain confidence because they know their purpose in life, praise in Jesus. They know what to pursue. That takes a woman's heart away from all irrelevances. Mind you, when you pursue who you are in Christ, the first thing that he deals with is your mouth. He says, he says in Ecclesiastes that let your, word, let your words be few. Don't go before the Lord with a lot of words because the Lord, a lot of words is basically a sacrifice of fools. If, if it's not your first time on this um, YouTube channel, then you probably um, have given you that scripture before. So a woman's words are supposed to be few. A woman's words are supposed to be extremely few. To say a lot of words is to offer a sacrifice of fools. I think it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Or is it 5? It is 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Walk prudently when you go before the house of God. Draw near to hear rather than to give a sacrifice of fools, that they, for they do not know that they do evil. 
So every time we go before the Lord, and, and, and I know we're reading God here, but remember there's an equation. There's the woman, there's the man, and there's God. As the woman, there's always got to be, there will be a man above you, especially when you're married. So God is saying, look, as a woman, as a creature that came out of man, when you go before the man, Make sure your words are very few so you don't give a sacrifice of fools. Also, scripture says somewhere here that in the magnitude of a lot of words, one is bound to sin, Christ King Jesus. Listen to verse 2 of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It says, do not be harsh with your words and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, Christ King Jesus. So, if you pursue the Lord early enough as a single lady, it helps you a lot. Through practicing to say very few words before the Lord out of reverence, it's very easy for you to have very few words before a man. And this is what Abigail did. She went to David with a few words. She wasn't so mouthy and running her mouth with hurting words like her husband Nabal. And the response is very clear here in verse um, 35, because then we get to see her victory. Listen, the Bible says, no, 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 we start from 32. Then David said to Abigail, blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from, av from avenging myself with my own hand. So now, because she's so humble, this lady Abigail, David is worshipping her and, and, and praising her. Blessed are you. Blessed is your God. Blessed is the advice. Why? All the words that Abigail used when talking to David were from the Bible. She was quoting scripture. Are you going to shed blood? God hates that. Are you are going to avenge yourself? God doesn't like that. So she has an understanding heart, the Bible has told us. So she tapped into David's heart because the Bible also says David is a man after God's own heart. So because David was angry only for a few seconds, she came in as an angel with her words and put this man back in place. Yeah. And in verse 35, it says, so David received from her hand what she had bought, brought him. And said to her, go in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. So these two, David, David and Abigail, are having a conversation where David also sounds like he's talking to God. I have heeded your voice. I have heeded your voice. I have heard what you have said to me. So you can go. So in a normal equation, normally men who are not in the word will not listen to a woman because their egos are high up there and God is nowhere in the equation. But my Bible tells me in Psalm 103 verse 20 that angels hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Yeah, Psalm 103 says, um, bless the Lord all you angels who excel in strength and hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Like angels, when they hear the voice of the Lord, they act really fast. So we see David hearkening unto the voice of the Lord in Abigail because Abigail is quoting scripture. Abigail is operating from understanding, from a point of humility because again, Jesus is humble. Jesus is humility. I sent you to read Philippians chapter 2. It says um, Jesus was very humble that even though he was God himself, he didn't find it robbery to come here on earth and operate and you know put on flesh like us guys, praise King Jesus. So all of this, is business that we can handle if we have the Lord. So what am I saying to you? If you've been struggling with too many words flying out of your mouth, we need to get intentional with reading the Bible. We read these stories. We read what God says about women that don't keep quiet. Proverbs chapter 7 or the whole of Proverbs, the book of wisdom. We should read the entire Bible. The beauty of the word of God is um, as you read it, it empowers you. It helps you. Remember the word of God is Jesus himself. Every time you open your Bible, the Holy Spirit comes up and helps us. Yes and no, it's a lot of pages, very, very many words. But hey, each verse you read empowers you to be a better person. I have broken the story of Abigail into little segments. But what I wanted for you to know is that 
Even though your man will not hear what you're saying to him when you try to speak to him, he will hear the voice of the Lord. When you submit and talk to him from a manner of I am under you, the Lord will deal with him. Better still, the Lord will communicate to you on how to go about the situation. But the Lord will listen to you and fight your, your battle because you're speaking the language of the Lord. You're speaking um, the voice of the angels. And the Bible tells me in Hebrews that angels are ministering spirits unto us, heirs of salvation. So when you speak the word of God, when you act according to the word of God, you're opening up a battalion of angels to work for you, to go at work for you because the book of Revelation, I don't want to go too deep into it. But everybody has got a ton of angels working for them. But the only way you activate the angels is when you're operating through scripture. So this is what Abigail was. Um, beautiful on the outside with a gentle and quiet spirit. You don't just acquire a gentle and quiet spirit automatically. It comes from being in the presence of the word of God continually. And this is business we have to do on a daily. Because every time you don't open your Bible for a few days, your old mannerisms come back. Guys, we're dealing in a spirit world. We are spirit beings. There's so many spirits flying around. Anxiety, anger, depression, envy, strife, and all of their negative cousins from the camp of Satan. And yet we're striving to have the spirit of peace. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So we, are, we want to operate under the kingdom of God, under open heavens as women. We have to be in the word. When we're in the word, then we know how to deal with people that are too complex for us. A situation of a woman earning more than a man is so tricky. Only God can help you. Because you will ask yourself, why is this loaded woman bowing down before a broke guy, David? He's a man with a vision. He's a man God has huge plans for. He's going to be so rich to the extent that after he's built so many houses, he even offers to build the Lord a temple because he's got so much money. When the Lord says, no, you can't build me a temple, he leaves so much money for his son, Solomon, who builds a temple out of a lot of gold. He also leaves good relationships with guys that in other countries that have the raw materials that Solomon will need, like um, the guy that gave them the cedar trees for building the temple. So David was going to be huge, big time, but it took a woman of an understanding heart and beauty to talk to David in a nice way and nurture him so he doesn't go and ruin his destiny by killing an entire house, praise in Jesus. So this is how I want us, by the grace of God, I want God to help us women to operate in this manner. That yeah, the man looks a certain type of way in the wallet right now, but hey, what's the calling upon his life? What is God saying about him? And for that reason, you stop to date the man, but you date his purpose. You date the calling. You nurture it. You become like Moses' wife. What's her name? Zipporah. You know what to do when you need it. God sends Moses out to go and work for him, to go and get the children of Israel out of Egypt into Israel. But then David hasn't, sorry, Moses has missed out on one tiny, tiny detail, the covenant of circumcision. The woman knew to step in because she was in the word. She knew the terms and conditions of who works for God. They have to be in the covenant. So when the Lord comes in with the wrath of striking Moses dead, this woman, Zipporah, dashes in and chops their son's willy, circumcises the kid, and once the blood drops on the ground, the Lord pulls back his hand. And now Moses can go in and start on that mission. So women, we are so powerful. First of all, God likes to talk to women. He always gives us the prior info. So when a woman is always in the presence of the Lord, she will know. She will know her purpose. She will know the purpose of the man. She will know what to do. Do you know that this whole business of Jesus being birthed, the Lord told Mary way before he told Joseph. So when Joseph was in bed being upset like, yo, this virgin girlfriend of mine, fiance, she's old. She's been knocked up by some random dude in the village. So I think I'll leave her quietly. It's okay. I won't tell the whole, the whole village that she's a whore. I won't embarrass her. I'll just get up and catch a bus to Paris. The angel of the Lord came in and said, don't do that. That what she's carrying is of the Lord. But guess what? Before Mary even got pregnant, the angel of the Lord came to Mary and said, Blessed are you, Mary, among women. You're going to conceive, but it will be of the Holy Spirit. So when Joseph was planning to dump Mary, Mary knew that Joseph was not going anywhere because this child is of God. 
in my Bible tells that whatever is born of God overcomes. And also Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 14 says that I know that what the Lord does is forever. Nothing can be taken from it. Nothing can be added to it. So we have Mary very calm and peaceful in her relationship. We don't find her quarreling with Joseph like, yo, dude, you're acting up. I think you want to dump me. No. She knows. The angel of the Lord told her, praise King Jesus, same business with Elizabeth. The Lord told Elizabeth. No, no, the Lord told the man first. Ah, okay, we'll stick to Mary. Praise King Jesus. So anywho, we need to tap into the word. Because with everything that's going on around the world, it's cool for us to scream like we know what's happening. We need to give our two cents. We have to give our opinion. This book right here is what helps us to calm down to maintain our beauty, to be Abigail's. Because like I said to you, when we run this mouth too much, the beauty starts to fade. We send the man into the arms of a harlot. Praise King Jesus. Anyway, also when we're having issues at home, boy, even at work, I don't know. But I think today we're touching um, relationships mainly. As a woman, don't cry out to the man. Cry out to the Lord. I don't know how many minutes I've been here with you. I can give you another example in the Bible. Yeah, I think I will um, cry out to the Lord. Um, there's a story of a gentleman, Jacob, two wives, Rachel and Leah. Rachel was the prettier one, but boy, did Rachel have a mouth. Rachel was how many minutes? One hour. Guys, I'll try and be quick. So, yeah, Jacob, two wives. Rachel and Leah. Rachel is the pretty chick, but she's such a winger. Yeah, she's running her mouth, complaining all the time. And then you have Leah. Leah was not so pretty, but she was the praying wife. She was the lady in the world. Leah had an understanding heart, right? And this story, well, it's it, it's all over Genesis. Maybe you can start from um, verse 29. Genesis 29. Laban, their dad, had two daughters. Leah, the older one, Rachel, the younger one. Leah's eyes were, you know, delicate, the Bible says. Some version says Leah had lazy eyes, but it says Rachel was very beautiful of form and appearance. So Leah fell in that category of, I have beautiful eyes, I have good hair, I just good out external beauty, right? Sorry, Rachel, gosh, Michelle. Rachel was pretty. She was very beautiful. Jacob fell for Rachel and decided to marry Rachel. But there was some remix over there. Go read for yourself. He ended up marrying Leah first. But Leah wasn't the prettier chick. Leah was just prayerful. But like I told you earlier, this Rachel chick liked to complain a lot. She liked to run her mouth. And that is because she was not in a place of prayer. She was hardly in the word. She, related, um, she relied so much on um, the gods of her father's house. Right, and um, case example, we can use Genesis chapter 30 very quickly. Genesis chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. I want to show you the difference between a lady that's on her knees who reports her matters to God and a lady that talks too much to the extent that she bends the man's ear and the man can understand what's going on and then she starts to look unpretty. Praise King Jesus. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1, it says. Now, when Rachel saw that, okay, rewind just a little bit. This man, Jacob, he went to marry these two chicks because the whole agenda was for Jacob to bath the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob went to marry a woman. He had to marry a woman from um, his mother's house because he was not supposed to marry Canaanite women. He was supposed to keep a covenant, keep a covenant because he was supposed to bath the 12 tribes of Israel. That was the whole agenda of his marriage, him marrying these two chicks, right? So the Lord was very, very specific on that one. And the Lord used Jacob's mom very well. What's her name, Rachel? To make sure that this happens. So now he has two wives and the complainant, Rachel, the one that's always running her mouth, is not having babies. And it doesn't surprise us because she does not pray. She's not in the Lord. She takes matters into her own hands. She's into witchcraft because even when they're leaving their father's house in the future chapters, she's the one that steals her father's gods. Like she does not know who Jehovah is, praising Jesus. So anyway, quick one. 
verse 1. It says, Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob not children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I'll die. Verse 2. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? So you see, Jacob knows God. Rachel only knows her pretty face. So the only weapon that she has is her mouth. Everything is for quarreling, 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 quarreling. To the extent that she's, you know, pushing the man. Give me babies, give me babies. And the man knows that children come from God because when God created us in Genesis 1.28, he said, go be fruitful and multiply. So Jacob knows that it is the Lord that gives children. So this makes Rachel such an irritant, right? Now when we look at a woman like Leah, her co-wife, Leah takes matters to the Lord. As in, Leah takes her mouth to God. She uses her mouth to pray. Never once did we ever catch um, Leah complaining to her husband. Never once when you read this entire story. And we have a nice scenario in Genesis 30 verses 14 to 21. I'll give you a summary so I can be quick. In all this drama of looking for babies, <laughs> um, Leah's uh, son, Reuben, she um, the, Reuben goes to, to to you know to do some hunting in the wilderness, and then he finds um some wild mandrakes. What are mandrakes? Mandrakes um the the wild plants like the roots. Um, back in the day, they were known to enhance one's sexual powers and fertility. Yeah, so Reuben comes back with the mandrakes. Rachel sees Reuben holding the mandrakes. And she starts to have a conversation with Leah, like, yo, get your son to give me some mandrakes and let's do butter trade. I take the mandrakes, then you can have my husband for the night. Because I think that night, it is Rachel that was supposed to spend the night with Jacob. So she exchanges, exchanges her turn to take these um, fertility or sexual things to enhance herself and sends the man off to Leah. Guess what? That night... Because this Leah is so prayerful. She doesn't believe in artificial stuff or whatever herbs for sexual, I don't know, getting pregnant and things. She's just prayerful. And, and Genesis chapter 30 verse 17 says, the Lord had, listen, sorry, verse 17, Genesis 30 17 says, and God listened to Leah. <laughs> God listened to the conversation, listen. And Leah conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. So Leah, because she turns her mouth to God and the reason God sent Jacob to Uncle Laban's house is so that they could birth kids in that lineage that would later birth the Christ, like no pollution with other tribes. And Jacob is, in, I mean, um, Leah is on son number five, right? Uh, the next verse, um, verse 18 says, Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given um, my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Oh, this woman, this layer lady, when she thought she was done popping babies, she gave her maid to Jacob because she knew the agenda that this man has to birth as many as 12 sons. So if I'm not getting pregnant, he might as well take my nanny so that the destiny can be actualized, first in Jesus. So you see how these prayerful people function. They go beyond emotion and everything, right? Anyway, she goes ahead to have a sixth son whose name is Issachar. So, yo, no, the sixth one is Zebulun. So Leah has two more children, Issachar and Zebulun. And on top of that, God gives her an extra child. Nyongeza, who? Dina. Dina, because we like to talk about the 12 tribes of Israel, but we never talk about the girl. So God gives her a little girl as well, who turns out to be a blessing for Israel anyway, or for Jacob, because when they move to another city, she finds this guy, the guy rapes her, but then the guy falls in love with her. And through you know, their relationship, the, Jacob and his children end up getting citizenship in that city. They end up getting jobs. Then they enter the people into the covenant with God. It turns out to be a beautiful thing at the end of the chapter. Only in the Bible will you find such stories. 
where a story that starts with rape ends up very beautifully. Guys, read your Bibles. I don't want to tell you all these juicy stories. But what I'm trying to point out is because Leah was never verbal with her husband, like she never poured out venomous words, she only went to the Lord. The Lord always was in her corner. The Lord fought her battles. And and, and Rachel's mouth, well, Rachel later has babies. She goes ahead to have Joseph who's also a good child because then Joseph takes us to Egypt and everything. But in this specific chapter, in this scenario, we see Leah excelling and Rachel, Rachel, Rachel's mouth leads to her downfall. How is that? Um, this woman, Rachel, she, um, as they're moving to, 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 to oh, what chapter is that? I'd love to share it, but you know, I don't want to read it because I don't want to keep it here too long. But as they're moving to where they're headed, this woman dies during labor. She dies to, to she meets her death, you know, and, and then she's, she dies when she's giving birth to her second son and she calls the boy Benoni which means son of sorrow. Again, we're seeing her mindset because her labor was so hard and painful. She gives her child a bad name. Like her mouth, how can you call your child Benoni, which means son of sorrow? What helped this child is that um, her dad, the, 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 the boy's dad was around, Jacob, and Jacob changes the name to Benjamin, which means um, son of my right hand, you know? So it takes being in the word. Rachel dies before they get to Ephrath. Ephrath um, means Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the city where kings are born. Isn't that where Jesus was born? So Rachel can't even go to Bethlehem where beautiful things are birthed because of her mouth. I need us to be ladies that are fruitful and multiply and can chill in Bethlehem. And this can only be via the word of God. So, I have talked about our mouth as a beauty stealer and I can only emphasize this, I, I don't know how many times, the only way for your mouth to speak peace, to speak joy or even to shut up when it should be shut is um, by being in the word of God, having the knowledge of the word of God. Start small, read better still. You can listen to the audio Bible. Make it a habit, make it a lifestyle. Life is so full of challenges. Every time you wake up, someone is ready to upset you. But if you have a set time where you're continually in the word, the spirit of the, of the living God overrides all other spirits that are waiting to upset you. If you're living in a house where the man seems totally impossible or the boss seems totally impossible, it's being in the word that can help you to have few words. Instead of talking to these people, you can just go and talk to your God and your God will sort them out and everything will be okay. And, and we've talked about a lady that's waiting for their husband to get in a position of provision. The best way to wait is to wait whilst in the Lord, whilst in the word of God, because you don't want to be that chick that will lose that man just before he actualizes destiny. And then every time you see him walk past, cruising and living the life you're thinking that should have been me and in re reality you know that it is your mouth that led you down so ladies i need god to help us in polishing these mouths of ours praise king jesus okay um if you haven't given your life to the lord yet now is a good time because we need him to help us on this journey okay just give your life to christ what does that mean just Believe from everything that I have told you. What you need to do is believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Because again, it is believing Jesus that gives us peace. Yeah? It is believing in God that qualifies us for righteousness. The Bible says that Abraham was considered righteous because he believed God. So when you believe, you will get peace. I think it's in um, Isaiah 32. I need you to believe so we can have a good life here on earth and in heaven. I need us to believe so that God can help us in this journey of dealing with, um, of not having to open our mouths unnecessarily. Okay, Isaiah chapter 32 verse 17 reads, The work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Your work is to be righteous. 
What is righteousness? Believe in God, right? Then you will have peace. So when you have peace, you don't run your mouth unnecessarily. Praise King Jesus. And the effect of this, you will have quietness and assurance forever. Why do you have assurance forever? You are assured of what the Lord will do about that situation. So you don't have to stand on tables screaming to people about what they have done and what they have not done. Praise King Jesus. Also to be in the word is what humbles you in the presence of other people. Praise King Jesus. Because as you read about Jesus, you acquire his nature. Read about him in the first four Gospels. Luke, Matthew, Mark. Luke and John, praise King Jesus. Okay, so let's give our lives to Christ, believe him for the impossible, and then he'll come in and do all the work for us, okay? Put your hand in your heart and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the words that I've heard. I believe in my heart that you died for me, and you rose again, and you seated on the right hand side of the Father, and you shall come back and take me. Remove my names from the book of death and put my names in the book of life. Satan, I renounce you, I reject you. Jesus, from today henceforth, you are my Lord and Savior. Thank you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the words that you have shared. I pray that you send your spirit, Lord, to sit on our mouths so we can have a gentle and quiet spirit, a gentle that Abigail had, as a gentle spirit that Abigail had, and a gentle spirit that Leah had so that we may live peacefully with the people that you have trusted us with. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Thank you. Bye.